Hello, everyone. This is Dave Farnsworth with the Regulatory Assistance Project. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. The city is in my hearing room, working with local government in utility commission proceedings. Now, before I introduce you to our moderator, I would like to run through a few logistical details. Today's webinar will run for 60 minutes. Because of the number of attendees, we will keep you all muted we encourage you, however, to submit questions and do so in the questions pane. And we will do our best to get to as many of them as we can. And finally, you should also know this webinar is being recorded in order to make it available to you and to others unable to attend. In a few days, we will send you a link to the recording. Our moderator today is Tyler Paulson. Tyler's Deputy Director of BEI, the Building Electrification Initiative. In his recent past, he was Senior Energy and Climate Program Manager in Salt Lake City, Environmental Sustainability Manager for Park City, and before that, Vice President and Operations Manager at Goldman Sachs. Once again, welcome to you all, to our panelists, and to you, Tyler, the mic is yours. Great, thanks Dave for, for that introduction. I am personally very excited for this panel today in my role with, with Salt Lake City. Um, spent a fair amount of time at the Utah Public Service Commission in, in understanding and, and engaging in proceedings there. So I think it's, it's, it's a great um, topic to discuss how cities and counties can participate and help influence state level energy policy. And so um, to that end, we're going to jump right in and provide some brief introductions for our panelists. I would encourage um, anyone that's interested in learning more to jump online and look at, at their full bios. But starting in, in the top left, we have Daniel Sass Burnett, who is the Director of Domestic Grants for the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, also known as NARU. Danielle leads a team focused on identifying emerging challenges and connecting state commissions with expertise and strategies to navigate complex decision making. She also recently oversaw the development of a mini guide focusing on local government engagement in commission processes, making her a great choice for a panelist today. To the right of Danielle on, on the slide is Commissioner Clifford Rexhoffen. He was appointed to the California Public Utilities Commission in January 2017. At the, CU, at the CPUC, his key areas of interest include decarbonization, safety, environmental justice, and enforcement. He co-leads several internal agency initiatives, including implementation of the Commission's Environmental and Social Justice Action Plan and the development of a more uniform and formal commission enforcement process. We're excited to learn more about his experiences and perspectives today. On the bottom row, we have Chair Thad LaVar. He was appointed to the Public Service Commission of Utah in 2012 and later appointed commission chair in 2015. Given today's focus on accessible commission processes, I'll note that during his um, tenure in, in the Public Service Commission, the Utah PSC has redesigned its website, adopted a paperless approach, streamlined numerous administrative rules and processes, and also modernized its administration of Utah's Universal Service Fund and the speech and hearing impaired program. One of my favorite facts in his bio is that before attending law school, Thad was a public school teacher in Texas and Arkansas. And then finally, we're also joined by Anne McCabe, Principal and US Program Director at the Regulatory Assistance Project. Ms. McCabe has more than 25 years of energy environmental policy experience in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors including her time as a commissioner at the Illinois Commerce Commission from 2012 to early 2017. Ms. McCabe has taught energy and environmental labs at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy, where she has a master's degree from that same program. Okay, and so with that, we are going to jump right into the, the formal Q&A session. Uh, later on, as Dave mentioned, we will get to audience Q&A. And so if you have any questions um, at any point during this conversation, please put them into GoToWebinar and we will get to them um, in the latter half of this discussion. But to kick things off, I wanted to start with Danielle Sassburnett. Uh, you oversaw development of the National Council on Electricity Policy mini guide that highlights local government engagement with public utility commissions. Can you explain some of the motivations for developing that resource and the process you went through? And then additionally, could you talk a little bit about the unique 
local perspective that, that local governments can bring to the process. Of course, thanks, Tyler. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all and share the mini guide that we developed. Um, in answer to your first question about the motivation for the resource, I personally worked with state and local governments on clean energy policy and programs throughout my career, and so I'm very interested in understanding how different offices and decision makers interact, who holds which keys to change, or who could implement various approaches among the puzzle pieces in energy policy. So uh, also over time have seen local governments move from trying to partner with utilities directly to recognizing the opportunity of going to commissions and talking to commissions about what it is they're trying to achieve. So with the mini guide, I think what we've really done is um, helped to enhance the understanding of different folks' roles, their constraints, the opportunities that can produce effective collaboration across local governments and commissions, which of course is the point of the conversation today. So you also asked about the process we went through. Uh, the process that we used to do this was really trying to look across the country and identify a handful of different archetypes of engagement. We categorized those into four key approaches and then identified some good examples of each. So just briefly, the four key approaches were informal relationship building and information gathering that a local government might do to work with commission staff on specific issues. The second was what we called light touch methods, basically filing public comments or participating in stakeholder meetings um, hosted by the commission. The third was forming coalitions with other local governments or large customers to formally participate in commission proceedings. And finally, we identified a category where some local governments, primarily large cities, might actually hire expert staff or outside counsel to intervene directly in commission proceedings. And for the meeting guide itself, we interviewed a local government leader or two and a commission, uh, PUC commissioner or staff person from four states, California, Colorado, Hawaii, and Minnesota. So nice compliments to the folks who are on the line today. Great, um, you asked, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, you asked about the local government perspective and I'm sure this will come out more clearly over the course of the hour, but what we really saw was that as a convener of stakeholders and public processes, local governments themselves receive direct information about the impacts of energy policies on the ground, and they bring a cost-cutting perspective to commissions informed by their roles in public health and emergency services, economic development, um, building codes, et cetera. So particularly in areas where there's where resilience or clean energy, communicating the impact on localities on the same constituents who the commissions are supposed to serve, but from a more direct and grounded perspective can be really valuable for informing what is in the public interest, uh, which is what commissions are striving to uh, use as their guiding light throughout their processes. Okay, great. Before moving on, could you comment just briefly on, on where this is trending? Are, are we seeing more and more local governments become involved in commission processes? And do we expect that to increase over time? It does seem to be the case, and certainly, um, you know, our work in writing this mini guide, your work in hosting this webinar, I, I think is designed to make sure that local governments realize there are opportunities there, and there could be value for all parties if local governments are engaged in what's happening at the commission. Since there are key decisions that happen that impact local policy uh, at the commission level. So I would anticipate that it will continue to grow. Okay, great. Thanks, Danielle. Uh, let's move over to our participants in California and Utah, Commissioner Rekshoffen, as well as Chair LaVar. Um, can you both share some general reactions and reflections regarding the participation of local governments in a state regulatory setting? Uh, more specifically, do you each have some examples that you can share within your states along with lessons learned from local governments participating in proceedings? And let's start with Commissioner Rekshoffen. Uh, thank you very much, <clears throat> Dave, uh, and uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm subbing for my colleague, Commissioner Guzman Seves, but I'm delighted to participate, and, and it's a very timely discussion. And, and a lot of my insights follow what Danielle found in, in Nehruk's report. Yeah. It's, it's not always an easy or natural fit for local governments to 
insert themselves into our processes. And in California, we have some unusual processes that don't follow the, the rules for that, how local governments make decisions. We have pretty strict ex parte rules. We have public comment at our meetings that don't, don't allow for discussion of things that we're actually voting on, on the agenda. It's not intuitive or, or easy to understand. So the hierarchy of, of methods that Daniel laid out, I think is, is very helpful. We are seeing more participation from local governments. I think that's a very desirable trend, especially as we broaden into different areas uh, of regulation, including carbon reduction, resilience. Also, as we expand to ride sharing and other areas we previously haven't regulated. And it's, it's very desirable to have perspectives broader than some of our usual stakeholders. I would say we've had pretty decent formal participation from our larger uh, local governments, our larger cities, less so from smaller cities, although they do engage more informally. We hear from, we get correspondence from them, organizations representing them, and they find other ways to reach out to us. We have, we actually have several staff that we've hired over the past few years that are specifically devoted to outreaching with local governments. They routinely meet with local governments. They try to set up meetings with commissioners when uh, over uh, about certain issues. We've also been holding more of our voting meetings outside of the traditional places. We usually hold our meetings in San Francisco where we're headquartered or Sacramento, the state capital, but we've been doing more at, uh, pre-COVID, of course, uh, in other parts of the state. And we, we, get, we get requests to do have field hearings in certain places. For example, Lake County, which was a rural county in Northern California that has been devastated by wildfires over the past several years, asked us to do a workshop on power shutoffs in response to wildfires. And, and we did hold a meeting, a, a meeting there. The, the, the last thing I would say generally is we, we're, we may be different than some other states because we have a very robust group of community choice aggregation districts that re are comprised of local governments and they are directly regulated by the PUC, although not in the same way as trad traditional investor owned utilities. They consist of local governments, as I say, their governing boards are locally elected officials so they're more sophisticated and they're very involved in we get some perspective uh, that way. I would, in terms of specifics, I'm gonna cite to something involving uh, our recent safety and wildfire safety proceedings. We've had several proceedings dealing with the guidance and criteria for when utilities can proactively shut off power to avoid large-scale wildfires. Local governments were very effective participants. In they, of course, were very directly affected and, and, and very interested in the shutoffs, and they had a lot of complaints and, and, and experienced a lot of economic and social dislocation. In this case, they, they did some of what, some of the things Danielle talked about. They hired some experienced practitioners to represent them. They formed some very effective coalitions with advocates for the disabled, ratepayer advocates, environmental groups. They came to a lot of meetings. They came to workshops and other meetings. They also brought elected officials to some of those meetings to testify and also had elected officials come meet with us individually on different issues. And there's, of course, a, 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 a definite power when you when elected officials take the time out of their schedule to come meet with us. And they did raise a, a set of issues that are within their unique expertise, the impacts on vulnerable communities, coordination with that they heard from the telephone companies and carriers who had power shut off, notification to them and their emergency responders and so forth. I would say their intervention has has been successful 
in the sense that our new guidelines require our utilities to work much more closely with them. With the, we require them to set up regional working groups, which includes participation from local and tribal governments. We also have required the utilities to share data that previously they've resisted sharing because they said it's confidential. We've set up secure portals in order to get the information that local governments need to respond effectively to emergencies and plan for resiliency projects. So that's some of the experience we've had recently. That is fantastic. Thanks for um, sharing such, such detailed experiences there in California. Let's, let's move over to Chair LeVar in Utah for a little bit of commentary and his experiences. Okay, thank you, Tyler. First, I just wanna thank you for the chance to be on this panel. And then I'll also say thank you for, for using that shot of Salt Lake City instead of the front of the PSC building like you did for California. They have, a, they have an impressive looking building that the PSC is housed in. If you'd, if you'd put our building on the screen, it would be a lot less impressive. So, so I appreciate the state capital there, even though that's not, that's not where we do our work. And I'll just start with repeating a point that Cliff started with that I think is worth repeating that, and I'll just say it in a little different way. Utility commissions are not city councils and we don't operate like city councils. And so sometimes people who come from municipalities who aren't always participating in our proceedings, sometimes come with an expectation that we function more like legislative bodies, which even though we have some legislative functions, we, we don't function in the same way. We're primarily quasi-judicial, but in the, in the dockets that municipalities end up in front of us, things are a little bit um, more unique that way. We've had one great opportunity over the past year to partner with municipalities in Utah, and it's, and it's, and it's been a great chance to learn some lessons and to develop some collaboration. And I'll talk a little bit more specifically about it. One of the primary lessons that I learned from this past year, the, the process that I'll be describing, is the need to understand and respect both utility commission and municipal statutory and constitutional roles, authorities, and limits. Understanding the, the perspectives, but also the legal and constitutional authority and restrictions is really important, is an important starting point. And understanding state and local policy, the climate and the background for what state policy is, what individual muni municipal policies and goals are, um, combined with what the commission regulatory and statutory objectives are, we're having an understanding of all those things really helps the process move forward. And it's not just a partnership between the commission and the municipalities. I mean, the, the partnership really, in Utah at least, has four corners. And it starts with lawmakers. The example that I'll be using started with legislation. So the elected officials and the governor were involved in, in getting the statutes put in place. Um, the other participants are municipalities, uh, the commission, and the investor-owned utility. So all four of those cornerstones were important to the, to the partnership. The example that we've had in the past year is what's called the Utah Community Renewable Energy Act. And this was enacted by the Utah legislature and governor in early 2019. And so for most of 2019, we were engaged in the rulemaking to, to implement that statute, and that involved a lot of stakeholder meetings with a lot of participants who, who hadn't always been frequent participants at the Utility Commission. And the objective of the statute was, to, was directed at municipalities who are not public power providers. So this is not directed at municipalities who provide their own power to, the res to their residents. It's for municipalities whose residents are served by an investor-owned utility, but where the municipality has a desire to establish clean energy goals that are different from state policy. So if they wanted to establish more aggressive clean energy objectives to, to uh, basically 100% um, net renewable by 2030, it gives, it gives cities the opportunity to opt into that goal for the residents of their cities, not just for cities own use, but for, for their residents, even when they're served by an IOU. And the, the, the Public Service Commission was given a mandate in the state law to give opportunities for customer opt out for some residents of the cities to opt out and to maintain all costs and benefits with participants of the program. So those were our goalposts and our objectives given to us by the legislature. Now, the, the unique thing as we started working with municipalities is, as I said before, the, the legal and constitutional guidelines around our authority. 
in Utah, and, and this is a situation that won't be a one size fits all for every state. Every participant needs to understand what their state objectives are and what their state legal and constitutional underpinnings are. In Utah, the Public Service Commission can't dictate anything to municipalities, um, whether, whether they are public power municipalities or whether municipalities receive, whose residents receive electricity from the IOU. We can't, we can't impose any regulatory um, requirements on a municipality. However, the way this Community Renewable Energy Act was set up, it requires the municipalities to partner with the ILU to present a program to the commission ultimately for approval. And so the municipalities have to be a partner in the commission proceedings and their success in the program depends on the, the ILU's success in bringing their program in front of the commission. So that, that brought us all together as partners in a unique way. Um, and the first step of this process was spending most of 2019 with a, 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 a high volume of stakeholder meetings to work out administrative rules that would guide the process going forward. And we had quite a few. What was really important was was face-to-face um, -face time and just spending a lot of time understanding everyone's objectives and goals. And I know that's a difficult thing to say under current environments where no one's having face-to-face -face meetings. Um, but in 2019, we were fortunate enough to be able to do that. And the end result of that was a consensus draft of administrative rules to implement this, this statute that didn't have any anyone objecting to. There, there were no objections to the final draft of rules. Now we still have a lot of steps to go in this process through the regulatory approvals and a lot of a lot more details to iron out, but at least we were able to spend some time with each other, understanding everyone's objectives, and take the first step of getting the rules in place with an ultimate consensus outcome, which I think was great for everyone. Thanks, Tyler. Great. Thank you for that that overview of, of the catalyst in Utah for some of this local government involvement and, and some of the steps. Um, and as a reminder to those on the line, if you do have questions for any of our panelists, please submit those in the chat box and we'll get to them in the latter half of the webinar. But but let's move over to Anne McCabe from the Regulatory Assistance Project. Anne, um, can you describe any experiences that you had with local government participation in your time as a commissioner in Illinois? And then more generally, what insights and expectations do you have regarding the broader trend of cities, towns, and counties taking a more active role in state regulatory matters? Well, thanks, Tyler. Yes, as uh, you mentioned earlier, I was a commissioner in Illinois from 2012 to early 2017. And the city of Chicago uh, is a, a important uh, stakeholder in terms of both the number of citizens it represents, as well as it's a huge customer of ComEd in terms of the electricity it uses. I mean, there, the city's load includes buildings, trains, mass transit, jails, airports, schools, and firehouses. Um, I want to reinforce uh, some of Daniel's and others' comments about the PUC process and her mini guide addresses this really well. But uh, the Public Utility Commission process is quasi judicial, record based, and uh, not uh, intuitive always. So it, it takes time to learn how to interact with uh, the PUC and uh, I saw the city of Chicago partner with other groups, whether it was the Citizens Utility Board, the AG's office, uh, in some cities it may be a, a consumer council, and that serves a number of purposes. It strengthens and magnifies your voice if a number of groups all agree to issues. And it also, you, in most states, you need a lawyer to represent you and that's time and resources. So if groups can work together and just have one of their lawyers be the uh, liaison on a docket, that helps everyone resource-wise. Um, the kinds of issues uh, that cities are most often interested in will be in rate cases, especially rate design and how costs are allocated by customer class that can affect their residents uh, in major ways. 
and they'll want to make sure the the allocation uh, reflects what they think it should between a denser urban area and maybe a suburban or rural area. Uh, in some states, it'll be data access with more and more advanced metering implemented. And they may also be interested in energy efficiency programs the utilities are, and others are implementing. Um, and one other nuance, uh, I talked to the former uh, chief sustainability officer with the city and my former legal advisor had worked for the city and they stressed that it's important to have someone in city hall who understands the importance of these issues, but it can sometimes be difficult, A, to explain rate design issues and why the city should be involved. So, um, you know, cities can be risk averse. They said it's really important to have someone who understands it, who can explain that, and uh, someone who can interact with the commission as well as someone who can uh, talk to folks in the mayor's office and explain why it's important. Great. Turn it back to Tyler. Yep. Great. Thank you, Ann. Um, I wanted to circle back on a topic that's been mentioned quite a few times and, and a question for you, Danielle. So the mini guide has a section entitled opportunities to reduce barriers to local government participation. Um, can, can you describe some of those barriers, some of which have been discussed on this call and, and highlight what you view as more, some of the more successful solutions that are being deployed in the state regulatory realm? Sure, there are some um, really important ones already brought up as you know, Tyler, but I, we got some great examples and insights from the interviewees when we produced the mini guide. So I'll share what some of their tips were and things that they had done. Um, first, I think <laughs> the obvious one is just how daunting it is to understand exactly what the PUC does. And this was alluded to by our other panelists, former, commission, former and current commissioners. But one of the tips that I read um, that we got from Howard Choi, County of Los Angeles, um, was that when he first got to the county, he asked the consultant to prep a PowerPoint presentation just on the who, what, when, where, why, and how of the CPUC. And Howard noted that it was about 20 slides that explained who the commissioners were, how they were appointed, how to read docket numbers, the different types of formal and informal proceedings at the CPUC, and examples of successful intervention. And uh, Howard mentioned that, to, that for the, I think he was at the county for at least 20 years, but to the day he left, he still referred to those slides as being really helpful and valuable for understanding what types of opportunities there were to engage. Um, also got some great tips from uh, someone in Minneapolis, who one of the city, city staffers there, who mentioned that in one way of getting to know the protocol in your particular state is to see if meetings are recorded and watch footage to see how folks approach the commission, how they address the commissioners, to get comfortable with the idea of the real life situation before offering testimony, uh, take away the intimidation factor. So that was another really brilliant way of using resources that are freely available. Of course, there are a lot of differences right now and um, probably it's a lot less intimidating to participate currently since everything is online. Probably feels like more of an equal playing field. We also, in that vein, got some tips from some of the commissions, and um, some of these have been mentioned here already, but having a public advisor type position, a government liaison, regional offices, or moving various stakeholder meetings to different parts of the state, so it's not always in the state capital, all of those things can make it more accessible. We also hear lack of resources being a consistent theme. Um, Anne mentioned this just a few minutes ago. And some of the tips that some of our interviewees suggested were kind of criteria that they use at the city level in deciding whether to get engaged in what's happening at a commission. Um, folks from the city of Boulder and city and county of Denver mentioned that they really asked themselves if a particular issue or proceeding has a direct operational impact on the city and or if it their engagement will advance their policy goals for the city and really try to be very judicious in deciding which proceedings, which engagements to be involved in. Um, 
one of our interviewees mentioned that there are lots of different ways of becoming involved. And I mentioned some of these at the top of the call around putting in public comments. Um, there's also the possibility in some cases of showing up for public hearings. Um, someone from the city of Boulder mentioned that learning how commissions actually respond to the public can be valuable. Some really want active direct intervention or intervening in proceedings. Other might be more impacted by public comments. So there's a range of opportunities that can be used to engage and determine how to be effective. Um, another, I'll offer two more. Another tip that we saw for commissions is really trying to make sure that the regulatory process um, is as straightforward as possible and it's feasible for folks who are not as familiar to participate um, when when they can. Uh, Chair Lavar mentioned this to Utah's recent experience, but some of the other examples we saw were um, having robust stakeholder processes associated with various proceedings, um, employing working group sessions and less formalized investigatory dockets where the parties can learn together and can get to know one another and understand different positions. Um, we also learned through the mini guide that in Minnesota, sometimes proceedings do not require legal representation. So it's not required to hire outside counsel for the city to participate. Um, and also, Minnesota frequently holds many stakeholder meetings, sometimes facilitated by the third party or sometimes with the city itself. And then finally, I'll just uh, echo what I heard uh, Trey Lavar and, and Anne say as well, which is understanding if you, if you are a city and you are going to participate in a proceeding, really understanding that the regulatory proceeding is designed to be quasi-judicial, that means decisions are based on the record. We had a commissioner in the mini guide note that um, the savvy participant in a regulatory proceeding understands that part of the dynamic is building a front end case as an intervener for why you belong, but the real heart of participation is understanding their purpose is to shape the record in a way that relates to the original action. So if, uh, as uh, Chair Lavar was mentioning, it's not a local government or city council meeting, it's not enough to tell a story. The story has to be relevant to what's going on in the proceedings if you really want to have an impact and make sure that the position that you're taking is going to influence what the outcome is as the commissioners are deciding in the public interest. So those are a few of the barriers and um, tips or strategies that we understand some folks have been taking across the country. Great, thanks, Danielle. Those are some great examples and replicable examples for people to follow. And, and just as another reminder, we there is a link to this mini guide that Danielle's been referencing. It's shared in the chat box, uh, a link on Nehru's website. So please, please go there to review uh, in more detail some of the ideas that she was sharing. And then also I will note, we are probably a few minutes away from jumping into some audience Q&A. We have some pre-submitted questions that we can get to, but if you have anything new um, that's come up during this this panel please share that in the chat box and, and we'll we'll go from there so uh, let's circle back to California and Utah to hear some on the ground perspectives from the commissioner and, and the chair um, so Commissioner Rekshoff and Chair Lavar, have you found that local governments sometimes bring a different perspective on policy priorities relative to the prevailing guidance in your states and in both instances it sounds like you've, you've mentioned that um, so, for example, local governments often have unique goals or targets on carbon reduction or other priorities. Can you uh, shed a little, little more light on some examples happening within your states and speak to both the benefits as well as challenges of considering these uh, different viewpoints from, from local governments? And let's start with a response from Chair LeVar. Thank you, Tyler. Um, we, we do have that situation you described in Utah. There are uh, there are some of our larger municipalities in Utah who, who do have different goals, particularly different carbon reduction goals than the state. And, and, and that bleeds into other issues besides energy and carbon reduction as well. The relationship between our legis state legislature and, and those municipalities is sometimes tense and sometimes adversarial. 
this example that I'm talking about is, in my mind, one great example of a time when that wasn't the case, where that relationship became more collaborative. And again, it started with a legislative effort where the legislature recognized that there are these municipalities in Utah that have different carbon reduction goals than the state than state policy. And of course, under our state constitution, the ultimate ripcord on that is those municipalities could choose to, to become public power providers. But that's a, a, a major expensive undertaking that, 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 that involves a lot. And so the goal of this legislative effort was to provide an opportunity to allow these municipalities to pursue those goals in, a, in, a, in an easier way than, than the ultimate ripcord of, of switching to public power, which is obviously a, a nuclear bomb, at least for a, for a, large, for a large municipality. So, so the legislature heavily debated and talked about this policy and, and implemented a statute that gave us the guidance for how we would work with our investor-owned utility and the municipalities to do that. And as I said, they, they enacted Utah's Community Renewable Energy Act. And so at, at the legislative level, they, they established two high-level objectives that we and the cities were required to, to look at, to, to maintain as we build this collaborative process. And the two biggest objectives were providing a reasonable initial opportunity for residents of these municipalities to opt out of the program if individual residents chose to opt out, and then making sure that costs and benefits of the program flow from and to participants only. And so that's, that's the goal. And as I said, we, we've, we've completed the first step, which is the rulemaking, and that was a lengthy process that took most of 2019 that resulted in a consensus where we'll be looking forward to um, the docket where the investor owned utility after working out a program with the municipal partners brings it to the commission for approval. Um, but just to circle back to your question, all of this started from a recognition that yes, there are some municipalities with goals that, that diverge from state policy and our legislature wanted to provide, our legislature and governor wanted to provide a way to accommodate that with some with some guideposts and with some objectives. And that's what we're working through right now. And so far, it's been successful. As I said, we still have a, a long road to go to get this implemented, but the first step ended in, with the rulemaking process ended very well. Great, thank you, Chair LeVar. And Commissioner Rekshoff, and any, anything to add or, or differing perspective from, from California? I wanted to mention three, uh, two examples, well, two, one and then two two sides of a, a coin on the second example. In California, we, as I mentioned, we have community choice aggregation districts, which are local governments who form joint powers associations, and they take over the purchasing of uh, electricity from the incumbent investor-owned utilities who maintain the transmission and distribution lines, but this, the CCAs do local to do the electricity procurement and they've been pushing to meet our very ambitious clean energy goals more quickly than the state and we've had challenging sets of proceedings especially over the cost sharing of of, of energy purchase for load that departs from the uh, the investor owned utilities to the ccas and how that should be done and over what period of time and just as a, a, a further illustration of what some of what we were talking about a little bit earlier, the mayor of San Jose is the chair of the local peninsula clean energy, where it's actually Silicon uh, San Jose clean energy. And he participated in some of these processes and just became extremely frustrated because there wasn't the ability to sit down and talk with all the parties and meet with all the commissioners and hash out a solution in the way he's used to doing in the typical legislative process that's as dad said it's the puc is not a city council but but that's a case where they wanted to move more aggressively than they thought the puc was doing we had a larger set of ratepayer interest to balance statutory directives and and it wasn't a, an easy fit, but his voice was very important. And again, uh, we're trying to work through that, but the, 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 the record-based quasi-judicial nature of our proceedings made things more complicated. I wanted to talk just for a second about the, the question you asked in the context of building 
decarbonization because we've had local governments participating on both sides of the issue at the CPUC recently. Southern California Gas, the largest gas utility in California, has been enlisting many local governments uh, in their efforts to slow down some of the building decarbonization programs required by state law. And a number of local governments have been coming to our meetings and forming coalitions to, to speak out about this. Uh, on the other hand, we have a number of local municipalities in California, over 30 that have adopted building codes that go beyond state law, some prohibiting gas hookups or requiring extra levels of efficiency if, if, if gas is used. And they've been participating in our proceedings, arguing that we need to do more at the state level, and in particular at our commission, we need to provide greater incentives, broader ranges of incentives in order for them to be able to meet not just uh, their local decarbonization targets, but also their local climate action and clean energy goals. So we've seen uh, we've seen both sides. It's it's a challenge, both a challenge and an opportunity, which we can talk about in another panel. But the, the electrification push raises statewide issues about rates and equity, uh, and who's bearing the costs of of electrification, which which cities are going forward, who's getting stuck paying for the legacy infrastructure that that are challenging to work out at the state level. And I think we need cities to participate and, and lend their voice as, especially in California, they move more aggressively to decarbonize their building stock. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks for sharing those examples. Um, before we have some, we have a handful of questions. Before jumping into those, I wanted to circle back to Anne McCabe with with regulatory assistance prog, uh, project. Anne, do you have anything to add or highlight on this topic in general before I share some some of the key questions we got from the audience? But just one point on the quasi judicial process is that uh, rate cases and other dockets are often litigated. So to the extent there's good information in the docket, uh, sometimes courts will overturn what commissions do um, or reinforce it. Um, so that's just another a nuance that uh, sometimes those uh, get litigated. Okay, um, so Anne, maybe let's, let's start with you with a response to this question. So beyond local governments just bringing their needs and perspectives into commission processes, um, what kind of evidence and information do you think is it helpful for cities and counties to, to bring into a commission process in order to help inform decisions? Uh, well, first is you know, weighing in on things like rate design and cost allocation if they have the expertise to do so either on their own or pooled with other groups. And, and the other is the impacts. Uh, if you can translate what some of the proposed uh, rate design might mean for the residents and or the city's uh, electricity burden, that's important. And I also just want to reinforce that when possible, try to get to know your commissioners, their advisors, and some of the key staff outside of documented proceedings. Great, thanks, Anne. And, and Danielle, maybe if you could comment a little bit on this question, you had earlier on highlighted four different approaches for local governments engaging in commission matters. Um, to that end, like among those approaches, which one or, or ones is it really important to rely on, on evidence as opposed to some of the more inf informal Kind of information or opinion sharing from local governments? I think that's a little bit hard to, spec to say generally uh, as it will depend on the exact docket but in any case actually bringing in you know new facts new information that otherwise isn't being presented by any of the other interveners is really the bottom line 
and the way to influence the process um, to bring additional data or, as Anne was just saying, you know, information about impacts so that the commissioners can really weigh those alongside whatever the utility is proposing and any other interveners are offering. And that's, that's the way to make, to influence the change um, as a, on the bottom line. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, Commissioner Rekshoffen, we, we have a question about utility commission processes sometimes being perceived as an inside game and, and kind of given your, your experience and, and uh, engagement with non-traditional stakeholders, can you comment on that in terms of what are effective practices that, that make the process a bit more open and, and invite perspectives that might not be as well informed, frankly, of, of, of the process at, at a commission level? It is an inside game and it's it's very much it's a challenge. We at the California PUC have been spending the last year or two working on an initiative to make our process more accessible to the public, easier to navigate. We've been trying to classify more proceedings under our state law in a way that we do not have to have evidentiary hearings. We can have proceed more akin to notice and comment rulemaking where we have a staff proposal and a workshop and proceed without litigation as the, the kind of uh, uh, fully litigated proceeding that, that Ann mentioned. We've been experimenting more with workshops more in general or on mock meetings where all five commissioners are present and we hear from a panel of experts. We've been doing more meetings in the communities where we'll, in a given proceeding, we'll have a group of, of parties maybe present or stakeholders present, but go actually into the community and do things in a less traditional way. We've been expanding our, our efforts to try to do more remote participation. And one of the silver linings of the COVID crisis is that we've been doing much more remotely and I think getting uh, more participation uh, from corners of the state that we 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 don't otherwise get it. I just want to mention one thing while I have the floor, which is we have an intervener compensation program. Not all PUCs do that, that award compensation to uh, parties who participate and, and successfully advocate for a position. They have to be nonprofit. They can't be interested parties. We do have, uh, we do allow for local governments to recover, but only in, in, in relatively narrow circumstances and uh, it has to be uh, uh, basically if they intervene in, in in a proceeding to protect the health and safety of residents following a catastrophic material loss to the residents so for us and then for commissions more generally we might think about liberalizing these rules so that local governments can recover their cost of participating in Meetings and make it easier for them to do so. Okay, great. And I wanted to follow up with Chair Lavar on something that, that was just mentioned around remote participation. That, that ties into an audience question we received. And the question really is around how to invite the participation of smaller cities and even rural cities into some commission proceedings. I know in Utah, there's um, a couple dozen local governments that have made this commitment to net 100% renewable electricity, some of which aren't, aren't near um, the commission offices or the capital city itself. And so to that end, is there anything that you're kind of learning or experiencing as meetings have shifted into the virtual realm that might might be a benefit to inviting um, some of those further away stakeholders longer term? I think that's a, that's a really important question right now, Tyler. And, and while we're doing everything remotely, that, that does make participation at least the mechanics of participation easier. I, I, I think the real challenge of, of, of maybe municipalities who haven't typically in the past participated in, in commission proceedings are probably more along the lines of the, of, of the issues that Cliff just discussed. Just the, there's a feeling that it's a, I think, I think the phrase was closed shop. There's a feeling that it's a, it's, it, if you're not already in and you're not already part of the process, you, there's a, there could be a perception of a steep learning curve. And so I think it's incumbent on commissions to, to try to battle that as much as, as much as we can. 
Um, and, and one aspect of that is, is making clear the difference between when we're acting in a quasi-legislative function like rulemaking or some of our administrative functions, and when we're acting in a quasi-judicial function, which where the record and where evidence is, is more important and, and more central. So, I, I mean, the, the obvious point is um, remote proceedings and remote hearings through electronic formats are certainly making the mechanics of the remote communities in Utah. I mean, Utah is unique where we have most of our population centered in one area, but there, there, there are municipalities and communities who are, who are quite a bit of distance from there. But, but I really think the bigger challenge is, are the things that, that Cliff was discussing, just making, helping parties who aren't familiar with our processes feel more comfortable stepping in and feel more comfortable understanding what's the objective of this proceeding. And, and that's just a matter of every commission needing to focus on communicating so that people who aren't always in our hearing room or who aren't always in our rulemaking processes can understand what it's all about and can understand what the objective is and what the steps we have to go through to, to accomplish that objective. Yeah, and I, I guess I would note that I, I think it's a, a two-way obligation between both commissions as well as any um, stakeholder that wants to participate. And so to that end, do you have any advice for local governments that are looking to become, for the first time, let's say, involved in, in commission proceedings, what, what type of homework they should be doing, apart from reading the great guide that's published on Nabrook's website? This is still for me? Tyler. Yeah, Chair LaVar, yeah. yes. Well, I, I think the first step is understanding what type of a proceeding it is. As I said, uh, um, because city councils, for example, are almost entirely legislative bodies, but commissions can be quasi-legislative and we can be quasi-judicial depending on what kind of a process it is. So finding out what the steps are and what the what the requirements are and what kind of a process it is, I think is the first step. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the suggestions that have already been made about just understanding and respecting the different statutory and constitutional authorities. When we're interacting with municipalities we have different legal parameters about what we can and can't do as a commission and they have different authority of what they can and can't do when they come before us so understanding and respecting the legal boundaries and the legal parameters of, of everyone's authority and everyone's obligations um, builds respect and builds an understanding that that helps i think helps the process move forward when, when we, just as the example I already gave, when we were working through our rulemaking process, it was very important to me that we always maintained the the requirement that we as a commission can't impose any any regulatory requirements on municipalities, but they had to be a partner with the investor on utility in this program. So they had a vested interest in the success of the IOU process and and program that they promoted. So that's the that's the balance that we've had to work on this particular issue we've been working through lately in Utah. Commissioner Rexhoffen, do you have anything to add on this front in terms of advice for, for cities and counties? How can they help enhance uh, kind of the collaborative nature and, and chances of, of mutual success when, when coming to a, a regulatory proceeding? A lot of what I would offer has been said and is presented in Danielle's guide. Also what, uh, Dad said, form coalitions. I think it's good to attend meetings and workshops where commissioners are present to leverage the influence. And unfortunately, I have to say that where the commissions are pretty stodgy and there's a lot of both precedent and also uh, inertia and, and legal requirements that keep us doing things the way we're doing things, even as we try to change. So I think we, they they really have to be prepared to become a party or partner with an organization that's a party and participate formally in rule in record based decisions on some proceedings if they want to affect the formal outcomes, because that's still the bread and butter of what we do and are likely to continue doing for some time, even as we try to get more accessible. So it's kind of like bite the bullet because 
you need to participate at that formal level in some proceedings if you want to affect our outcomes. Great, and Anne, do, would you have anything to add on this front in terms of, of advice you'd give to cities and counties? Just uh, reinforcing what others have said about uh, getting to know your commissions, their processes, and and partnering with others. Okay, great. And and Danielle, maybe if, if you could comment, um, a closing comment kind of on, on advice to utility commissions. You had shared um, some great tips up front, but but maybe close uh, with a reminder or or some reflections on on how utility commissions can can help with all of this. Sure. Well, I think you have some fantastic speakers in Commissioner Rukshafen and Chair Lavar and Ann McCabe, who provided quite a few great ideas. Um, I think I would just suggest for you know commissions that are already presiding over dockets with local government representatives to value their expertise as stakeholders who are also policymakers and really represent the interests of their constituents. Um, providing opportunities for participation that extend beyond the traditional judicial, quasi-judicial methods can be really valuable uh, for commissions that are not yet presiding over dockets with local governments. As we talked about, and some of this is a little bit different right now, but varying meeting locations, offering remote access opportunities, as we've talked about, using non-litigated proceedings when possible, like stakeholder working groups and informational meetings. And then, uh, as was also brought up, designating someone at the commission to be a local government liaison or a, a broader uh, stakeholder advisor who has some responsibility for facilitating those relationships and really being a go-to person for knowledge sharing so that should a local government or other important stakeholder reach out, there is someone who can help them understand what the process is, what they need to know, what the schedule tends to look like, what the ex parte rules are, um, you know, who else might intervene, and those important tips and tricks that um, someone gets to comfortable with as they experience the engagement over time. Okay, great. Thank you, Danielle. And I want to thank all of our panelists for, for joining us today for a really informative conversation on this topic. Our, our co-collaborators on this webinar um, from the Regulatory Assistance Project, I believe, have recorded this and we'll be circulating that recording for, for future viewing. And I'll also note that contact information for all the panelists is included on this final slide. So you can either respond back to RAP um, if you're not able to jot down these emails just now or um, just let any of us know if you have any questions. And so with that, I think we're, we're all set to wrap up and thank you everyone for your time today. Have a great rest of the week.